Arctic, early autumn. It's been two hours since radio contact was lost with two scientists. The expedition started successfully despite the significant depth. James and Christopher were the most experienced researchers at the station, and they maintained communication via the internal system throughout the journey into the icy tunnel. Reaching the halfway point, they made a stop to adjust the pressure in their protective suits before continuing their descent to 3,000 feet, where they left the specialized transport module and began their journey along a narrow ice corridor prepared in advance. The temperature in the tunnel remained stable at 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Just a year ago, extreme colds limited research in such conditions, yielding little scientific results. However, thanks to new technologies and specially designed thermal insulated suits for scientists, researchers could now expect to maintain a comfortable body temperature in icy conditions for at least three hours. During their movement through the corridor, both scientists maintained a continuous dialogue via internal communication, describing the terrain and cracks in the icy surface, noting its saturated, almost magical sky blue color. And suddenly, their conversation was cut off. Before them appeared a large crack. Everything was dark, and the icy walls seemed incredibly calm. Unnatural silence enveloped them. As they approached the crevice, they heard a sound. At first, it was just a lone, eerie whistle echoing through the icy corridor. The sound, perhaps, was caused by the wind or even some unknown natural phenomenon. The scientists began to look around for the source of the sound. One of them picked up a portable ground-penetrating radar and began to scan from side to side in hopes of detecting the source of the noise. However, they found nothing. The scientists were about to continue their journey when suddenly a loud crack sounded, and both researchers barely managed to jump back, seeing how the mirror-smooth surface of the ice in front of them cracked, widening the crevice even more. And suddenly, through the dense ice, about a dozen similar sounds rang out, surrounding them from all sides. They were louder than the first, and at that moment, darkness engulfed them. Fear became the last sensation to grip James and Christopher. Then the loud sound also suddenly ceased. Ethan Carter loved to observe the night sky. In New York, he couldn't see the stars, unlike in the Arctic, where they were not obscured by light pollution. The auroras danced in the sky, and the Milky Way shone brightly overhead. The night seemed alive and full of wonders, with islands of light suppressing the darkness of space. Could there be a more beautiful sight? In childhood, Ethan dreamed of becoming an astronaut. However, he was born not in the right place and not at the right time, so his chances were slim from the start. Instead, he became a geneticist and climbing the career ladder eventually became the chief scientist of the Eden Station. Instead of landing on the moon, he led a large team studying dangerous infections. The government chose the Arctic as the location for the station for several reasons. Primarily, it was done to prevent dangerous breaches of containment conditions and to study ancient viruses frozen under the ice. Some of them could devastate the Earth if released, and Ethan's superiors wanted to maintain an advantage in biological weaponry. The future was uncertain. Wars were happening regularly, such as in eastern Ukraine or in Africa or the Middle East. Some might have objected to working on weapons of mass destruction, but Ethan slept soundly at night. International relations were based on strength, and strength stemmed from technological superiority. To ensure his country's survival, he needed to outpace competitors by any means necessary. Perhaps one day his work would kill millions of people, or perhaps not. Though he preferred nuclear weapons to remain in their silos, they would come in handy if the end of the world ever arrived. Ethan was paid for the dirty work, but it was necessary work. 
Standing beside his special off-road vehicle, Ethan felt the cold seep into his suit. He wore warm clothing, including a parka, goggles, gloves, and a balaclava. But the Arctic was the harshest place on Earth. No one was entirely safe here, and he was miles away from the station, surrounded only by ice. But Ethan didn't mind. The sight of the night sky already warmed him. He knew that extraterrestrials existed. The samples he found in the Arctic almost convinced him that life came from space in the form of primitive viruses and bacteria. What strange and wondrous creatures inhabited the stars above his head? He hoped to live long enough to find out. Truth be told, the scientist enjoyed these quiet moments of solitude, which he couldn't find on the crowded station. Ethan didn't particularly bond with anyone, nor did he want to. Work was his life. Tyler calling Ethan, his assistant called him over the intercom. Ethan, come in. I'm here, he replied, just admiring the stars. Oh, good, I was starting to worry. James and Christopher have stopped responding. We have problems. Who would have doubted it? Tyler was naturally anxious and suddenly two lead researchers disappear while Ethan is out for a stroll. The scientist imagined his assistant panicking around the station and smiled to himself. However, carelessness could come at a high cost. So Ethan decided to return to Eden. We're detecting anomalous electromagnetic activity in the area, Tyler said. Probably just the auroras, Ethan replied absentmindedly. He looked at them, and their color seemed to change from green to a light shade of red. I'll be back soon. Sorry, I... Tyler's voice was replaced by radio interference. Ethan, what is... Tyler? The scientist called out, his communicator glitching. Can you hear me? Only static was heard in response. Tyler? Ethan called out again, squinting. The auroras above his head grew brighter, streaks of red light illuminating the frozen wasteland. The interference turned into a buzzing, almost piercing sound. Tyler? Another voice answered him, but not with words, but with a beastly roar. The ground trembled beneath the scientist's feet, small cracks and fissures forming in the ice. The sky grew brighter until the night turned into a crimson day. Realizing something was amiss, Ethan immediately jumped into his car and slammed on the gas pedal. The powerful reinforced wheels tore through the snow as the scientist raced back to the Eden station. Damn, damn, what's happening? Ethan continued to call out over the intercom, but all he heard were strange, unintelligible sounds. Tyler, do you see this? Two red auroras split the sky in half. Space itself tore apart as if the eyelids of a giant eye were opening. A black spot, expanding into a sea of red light, a black hole growing from the heart of a ghostly star. Desperately trying to get away, Ethan still peered out the window to get a better look at what was happening. Curiosity triumphed over self-preservation instinct. The black spot grew to gigantic proportions, allowing the scientist to peer inside it. Only then did he realize he was looking at the gates to the very fabric of space-time. At that moment, the ground behind the car split open, forming a hole, and a huge crack rapidly approached the scientist. No, no, no! Ethan drove faster than ever before, the car's engine smoking. He knew the fall was inevitable. The ground shook beneath the wheels. Because of the earthquake, the car's alarm wailed like a dying cry of agony. What is this? Ethan didn't finish the sentence before the hole engulfed him entirely, a stream of snow following behind the car. Ice shards scattered in all directions, shattering the reinforced windshield and throwing the SUV aside. The scientist hit his head on the safety cushion, the car flipping over a dozen times and darkness swallowed Ethan whole. Eden Station. Tyler walked down the gloomy hallway where red light flickered, 
creating tension with each flash. Around him, a frantic siren sounded, announcing a state of emergency in the laboratory building. Against the backdrop of radio interference, his communicator constantly caught echoes of chaos. Noises, screams, sounds of gunfire, and desperate pleas for help. The corridor was littered with traces of disorder. Blood, in some places, station workers' bodies lay. With each step Tyler took, he felt increasing disgust. Sweat dripped down his back, and fear paralyzed his movements. He tried to check every corner for survivors. Suddenly, a loud growl came from behind him. Turning around, he saw a huge creature resembling an oversized dog with impressive teeth and claws. Blood dripped from the monster's jaws, and he was wearing some sort of futuristic armor covered in slime. The scientist was stunned and frightened by this monster. Suddenly, he heard the voice of the station's security chief, Victor. Tyler, run! The scientist came to his senses and ran towards Victor, who had already pulled out a weapon and started shooting at the monster. The wolf-like creature dodged the bullets and ran away. Victor wasted no time and ran in the opposite direction of the monster, taking Tyler with him. On their way, they encountered twitching corpses, wounded people begging to be saved, blood and pieces of flesh. But Victor and Tyler, frightened by the whole scene, ran without stopping. What's happening here? The security chief asked loudly without stopping. I was about to ask you the same thing, the frightened scientist replied. After some time, they reached a large, brightly lit room where several other people were barricading the doors. A scientist with a badge reading Herman on his chest was giving instructions. And security guard approached him and began reporting what he had seen. Herman asked him about the doors leading outside. The guard replied that they were blocked and the control panel was on fire. The scientist started cursing loudly, convinced that someone had done it intentionally. Time passed and cries, sobbing, growling, and other disgusting sounds could be heard from beyond the door. People began to panic, realizing they were alone with the monsters. Some scientists began to suggest their ways to escape outside, through the ventilation shafts, breaking through the ceiling, or descending into the basement. All these suggestions seemed absurd, but it was clear that people were desperate. Suddenly, one of the walls collapsed, filling the room with dust and dirt, and monsters rushed into the room through the huge hole in the wall. When Ethan regained consciousness, the car was upside down on its roof. The scientist's vision blurred as he reached for the door, and it took him several minutes to crawl out of the SUV. Snow had piled up around him, and Ethan had to dig himself out with his bare hands. A few drops of frozen water slipped inside his suit, making him shiver. When the scientist managed to stand next to his car, he wondered where the stars had gone. It took him a moment to realize the truth. A huge metal dome loomed above him. The colossal black structure, comparable in size to a human city, was partially hidden under a layer of snow. Its smooth metal surface was like a starless night, and the eye-like windows seemed to be watching the scientist. Ethan held his breath. What was this? A spaceship or an abandoned station? Although he didn't believe in any god, he had to admit that his survival was nothing short of a miracle. Quickly checking himself for injuries, Ethan immediately tried to contact his station. Tyler, can you hear me? No reception. The scientist cautiously stepped out of the shadow of the metal structure to look up. He hoped to see the sky through the huge crack he had fallen into. Absolute darkness prevailed except for a few violet lightning bolts. Strange meteorological phenomena were probably interfering with communication. Ethan tried to dig out the car, but quickly realized it was hopeless. The successive blows had disabled the engine, 
and he had no idea how to fix it. The emergency radio also didn't work, so there was no way to contact Eden. However, emergency rations, a flashlight, a portable heater, shovels, and other basic tools remained in the trunk. He could hold out for a few days, hoping for rescue. His colleagues couldn't just leave him stranded in the Arctic. Yet doubts plagued him every time he looked up. Ethan took the flashlight, checked the battery, and decided to explore the place where he had ended up. It took him several hours. The size of the black structure defied comprehension, and indeed, it was impossible to tell how much more was buried under tons of ice. A cursory analysis revealed that it was made of strange metals that Ethan couldn't identify. Eventually, the scientist found an entrance, namely a crack in the structure, partially buried in snow. But it was large enough for Ethan with some effort to squeeze through. He almost tried his luck before deciding that going alone was too dangerous. He needed to contact Station Eden, his team, the military. They had to know. Everyone had to know that aliens existed. For no other reason would this structure be here. This black, perfectly smooth, metallic ship or station was of extraterrestrial origin, and that changed everything. It was the greatest event in human history since the discovery of fire. It would forever change the fate of the world. Ethan would live long enough to see humanity enter a new era of development using this discovery. Maybe they could even make contact with a highly advanced civilization, clearly capable of interstellar travel. National rivalries in the light of such an event now seemed insignificant. Humanity was not the only intelligent species among the stars, and internal disagreements no longer mattered. If the aliens were willing to share their technology, then no one would fight over resources anymore. Perhaps this discovery would contribute to global peace, to the creation of a unified human government that would no longer need biological weapons, for a moment, Ethan dreamed of a world that would no longer need weapons of mass destruction. But for now, he needed to somehow contact the station. He had to get out of this huge crevice. Ethan decided to walk. Maybe he wouldn't be able to get out of the pit, but at least he could go far enough to see the stars and orient himself by them or find a place with better communication. His flashlight was adapted to the Arctic cold, but it didn't have unlimited energy. The scientist walked for two hours in one direction and found himself back at the dome. He walked left and right, north and south, but every time, he returned to the starting point. Ethan always ended up back at the metallic structure. In the end, the scientist had to accept the bizarre truth. Somehow, space had folded forming an infinite loop. The outside world was closed to him, perhaps as a defensive measure by this alien contraption. It was no wonder he couldn't get a good signal. Unfortunately, this completely shattered his hopes of a quick rescue. There was only one place left to go. Summoning his courage, the man approached the crack in the structure and inspected it. Shining his light into the gap, the scientist could see little. However, the hole was large enough for him to, with some effort, squeeze inside. Is anyone there? Ethan called out. Hey, anyone? It was foolish, and the scientist knew it. It was unknown how long this structure had lain beneath the ice, and it was unlikely that any living creatures remained here. Still, it was worth a try. After all, who knows? Maybe the aliens somehow managed to survive. But there was no response. Gaining courage, the man reached his hands into the crack and slowly squeezed inside, holding the flashlight forward. Slipping out on the other side, Ethan found himself in a place that must have been something like a corridor or an airlock. He saw what looked like doors, and they were ominously torn apart, with icy dust floating in the room. The light from the flashlight illuminated strange patches of green slime on the walls, which Ethan avoided touching. 
Perhaps it was some unknown biological plant. At least he could breathe. Air from outside penetrated into the structure. It was cold here, but not nearly as intense as in the Arctic wasteland. The scientist passed through the next set of doors and entered a network of vast metal corridors. Red crystals embedded in the ceiling provided light, but half of them were shattered. Sometimes Ethan walked for more than 20 minutes in one direction, lighting his way only with the flashlight. His footsteps echoed in the cavernous structure, making him nervous. The ceiling was high, at least 26 feet. The walls were made of the same black metal as the rest of the ship, so smooth that Ethan couldn't find any signs of welding or riveting. Occasionally, he came across strange, nondescript doors, each of different sizes. Obviously, the structure was designed to accommodate beings of various sizes. But Ethan found neither a biometric lock nor a computer system. Attempts to open the doors with his bare hands led nowhere. Hey? The man's voice echoed through the empty corridors, but there was only silence in response. Is anyone there? What happened in this place? He didn't have to wait long to find out. After a long, solitary walk, he finally found open doors, or rather torn apart. The first room he entered was, in Ethan's opinion, something like a hangar, and it was as huge as an airport. But the most surprising thing was that the hangar accommodated a dozen vehicles the size of commercial airliners. They were alien craft, flat triangles with advanced reactors that reminded Ethan of stealth bombers. All of them showed signs of damage, and a strange symbol was engraved on their hulls. And the smell. A nauseating stench filled the air, making him feel sick. Is anyone here? Ethan asked, scanning the surroundings with his flashlight. Very few red crystals continued to emit light, so he could hardly see anything. Is anyone... At that moment, he directed the flashlight at the body of an animal. Startled, the scientist took a step back and covered his mouth to stifle a scream. The flashlight flickered, revealing another gigantic figure in the darkness. Its innards and strange organs spilled out of its abdomen. Holding his breath, the man aimed the light at the floor to get a better look at it. Bodies. There were bodies everywhere. To his horror, Ethan had stepped into an open grave. It was a slaughterhouse. One didn't have to be a detective to understand that a battle had taken place here, and the aliens had killed each other by the dozens, if not hundreds. They all wore strange, futuristic armor made of incomprehensible slime and various organic weapons integrated into their hands. However, the creatures were of different sizes and shapes. Some were reptilian humanoids slightly taller than humans. Others resembled wolves or werewolf-like monsters. Opposite them lay piles of red metal scrap and broken biobots. The machines had legs and arms like humanoids, as well as sharp claws. Damn. What the hell happened here? Ethan exhaled, surveying the corpses. Symbols were engraved on the slimy armor of all the aliens. Judging by the arrangement of the bodies, it seemed they had fought each other to the last being. Then Ethan inspected the hangar walls and discovered that they had been pierced through by some metal cones. Hatches on their noses were opened full of robots, most of which had been torn to pieces. It didn't take Ethan long to understand what had happened. The robots breached this metallic structure, ramming through its outer defenses with their small vessels. The inhabitants of this place put up fierce resistance, but were overwhelmed due to the overwhelming numerical superiority of the enemy, allowing the attackers to penetrate the corridors and spread throughout the structure. I... Ethan held his breath, trying to calm himself. What nightmare had he stumbled into? The scientist examined the bodies in case any of them. He himself didn't know. Pretending to be dead? Just wounded? His hopes quickly faded. 
the victorious side mercilessly finished off the wounded before moving on. However, as he made his way through the hangar, Ethan noticed a creature unlike the others. It wore futuristic orange armor like some others, but the body shape, two legs, two arms, broad shoulders, five-fingered hands, the way it contorted near the torn door. Ethan cautiously approached the body, studying it with the flashlight. Golden patterns connected the modular parts of the armor, and from a large hole protruded a frozen heart, but with wires instead of arteries and metallic lungs. The armor was surgically attached to the skin, just like the guns on the shoulders and arms. Nearby, the man saw a severed head on the floor. A shiver ran down Ethan's spine. It was a human head. The eyes, the nose. There was no mistaking it. Shaken, Ethan continued his journey into the depths of the structure, walking among the dead. By the time he emerged from the hangar into the adjacent chambers, he could barely take a step without slipping on severed hands, decapitated bodies, and mangled remains. However, that was the least troubling moment. He entered some sort of laboratory, where countless specimens swam inside techno-organic mechanisms shaped like hearts. Cable's veins pumped containers with green liquid, keeping their inhabitants in stasis. The transparent scales allowed Ethan to examine the creatures inside. Some of them had once been humans, but they had been gutted, and their organs replaced with cybernetic implants. However, most belonged to wolf-like creatures of various sizes. One was the size of a dog embryo, another, muscle mass, fur, fangs, and two gray eyes. In the next container was a larger slender specimen with four eyes and elongated arms. And in the container next to it, a spiky armored monster with a wolf's head. The largest was a colossal biocybernetic beast over eight meters tall. However, one exception stood out from the rest. Inside the container swirled a blue alien slime. When Ethan placed his hand on the alien glass that separated them, the slime extended tentacles and slammed against the wall of its prison. Are you really alive? Ethan whispered, stunned. Whoever you are, I'm glad to meet you, the scientist grimly joked. The temperature in the laboratory differed. It was very warm here. There were no frozen corpses. Suddenly, a roar erupted from his left. The man immediately turned and aimed the flashlight into the dark corner of the laboratory. In the darkness crawled an alien slightly taller than him. From its right arm remained a bloody broken stump. It was covered in fur and looked like a werewolf from fairy tales. The alien emitted a mournful, painful hiss, clutching the hole in its chest. There were also holes in its legs. My God, are you alive? Ethan suddenly began to pray. He exhaled and asked, Do you understand me? The creature carefully inspected Ethan before responding with a mournful sound. Then it looked at its wounds and hissed again. It couldn't understand the human, but it was intelligent enough to establish contact. And it didn't look hostile, just desperate. Although Ethan wasn't naturally compassionate, he couldn't ignore the suffering of the creature in pain, especially an intelligent one. I... I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I can help. The scientist cautiously approached the creature to better examine the wounds. I have... bandages in my car, but I'll have to go back. Although the alien's face showed nothing human, Ethan noticed a change in its eyes. Something cold and cruel. A gleam that instantly made him wary. Only reflexes saved the man's life. He jumped back. The monster, like a seasoned predator, quickly raised its left hand with claws and tried to grab the man. Dodging the alien's attack, Ethan stumbled and broke the container behind him. The scientist was too shaken to react when the monster tried to attack him again. The creature let out a menacing roar and crawled towards him. 
However, the man managed to gather himself and quickly got to his feet, backing away in horror. The alien, possibly suffering from terrible wounds, looked at him with hateful malice in its eyes. Go to hell, you bastard! Ethan growled before kicking the alien in the wound. Unable to support its weight on the stump, the monster fell forward, hissing in pain. More blood flowed from the wound and soon it stopped moving altogether. He... He tricked me, the man thought. He tried to lower my guard and kill me. He was dying but still tried to kill me. The realization shook Ethan to the core. He had always believed that alien civilizations advanced enough for interstellar travel had outgrown basic instincts. That they would be wise and peaceful. He was wrong. Every ecosystem had its predators, and he had just survived one of them. Only then did the scientist remember that he had accidentally smashed the container with the test creatures. Ethan glanced over his shoulder and saw a wave of slime crashing towards him. He tried to scream, but the slime immediately filled his throat. It engulfed the scientist entirely, starting from his head, filling his ears, merging with his skin, entering his bloodstream. It filled his cells and bone marrow, overloaded his nerves, and stuffed the man's brain with knowledge. Ethan tried to claw his eyes out, feeling the slime creeping up behind them, but his hands stopped moving. His entire body, his entire essence, slowly faded away. His mind fragmented as reality crumbled around him. Then he plunged into darkness. Station Eden. Tyler, run, don't stop, move your fat ass, Victor yelled. They ran through the gloomy corridor, aiming to reach the northern hangar of the station. The head of security was certain that despite the locked doors, there was a chance to escape outside through a window on the roof. Getting there was crucial. Tyler couldn't be abandoned because his biometric data was needed to open the hangar door. Damn, 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 what's happening? Am I dreaming? Tyler spoke in horror, panting heavily and trying not to fall behind Victor. Don't talk nonsense, this is all real, and shut up. Breathe evenly, if you lose your breath while running, you'll tire quickly, and that means you'll die. Follow me to the right. The man led the scientist on a shortcut to the hangar. A couple of minutes later, they reached their destination. Tyler opened the door to the hangar and the head of security led him to the locker room. Don't waste time, quickly put on warm thermal clothing, we have little time, Victor urged. After donning the special clothing designed for Arctic cold, Tyler and Victor made their way outside through the window on the hangar roof. The cold wind slapped Tyler in the face and he slipped from the unexpectedness, nearly falling off the roof. Victor helped him swearing profusely. It was very dark, no stars were visible, as if the entire sky was covered with a thick black cloak. They descended and sat in the nearest parked SUV. Victor stepped on the gas pedal and the car sped away from Eden Station. Soon, glancing in the rearview mirror, Tyler spotted a huge black metallic triangle hovering over the station in the sky resembling a giant spaceship. Victor, who also noticed the sight, was so surprised that he didn't immediately realize that a huge pit had appeared in front of their car. Their SUV lost control and carried by momentum plunged down into the wide crevice. Ethan slowly opened his eyes, feeling pain in his head and all over his body. He tried to stand up, trying to recall the recent events. Suddenly, overwhelmed by fear, he began to inspect his hands and legs, touching his face, checking himself. He found no tentacles, no fur. He had only two eyes and one nose. His hands and legs functioned normally, and he realized he was still Ethan. All his memories were intact. Then, with some apprehension, the scientist felt around his groin area and feeling everything in place sighed in relief. Thank the gods, nothing fell off. But why? As the slime crawled into his body, he felt it split into many pieces. 
His brain, his mind, he felt himself slowly turning into a different entity. He was dying. And now he stood in the lab virtually unharmed. Ethan looked around and saw the slime on the floor. It was dead. Did my body reject this creature? The scientist pondered. Since everything turned out this way, Ethan, despite all the danger, decided to continue exploring the black structure. Of course, he was scared, but his natural curiosity triumphed over fear. Leaving the laboratory, the scientist stumbled upon robots cut in half. And the farther he progressed, the more of them he encountered, probably because the defenders fought until the last alien, defending their territory. I hope I won't encounter any more living werewolf-like aliens or robots, Ethan said to himself. He believed that perhaps only the aliens in stasis survived the massacre, and he hadn't seen any working robots yet. It seems they wiped each other out, the scientist concluded. What could this have been? Interstellar warfare? Racial genocide? Space piracy? Something like that? Ethan mused. Most likely, this massacre was clearly a war of mutual extermination. I can't know for sure, but I really want to find out, the scientist resolved. Suddenly, he heard noise. Someone was approaching. Ethan quickly hid behind a small wall. The noise grew louder. It seemed someone was coming towards him fast. Did the werewolves catch my scent, Ethan thought. What to do? What should I do? He began to think frantically. When two figures appeared in the corridor, the scientist couldn't come up with anything. But to his relief, it turned out to be two of his co-workers from Eden Station, Tyler and Victor. Tyler, I'm so glad to see you, Ethan said, emerging from his hiding place. The two survivors stopped in amazement for a moment, but upon recognizing the station chief, they were overjoyed to see him. Damn it, Ethan, you're alive, the scientist said, hugging his boss. What are you doing here? Victor asked Ethan. It's a long story, but I'm glad you came for me. I can't get out of this crevice. There's some spatial anomaly here. However, I can tell you everything once we return to Eden Station. We need to gather a team and come back here. And we also need to report to the command center what we found here. Ethan kept talking without stopping. He wanted to share his discovery with the world. He didn't pay attention to the grim expressions on the faces of his colleagues. Ethan, wait. Listen to me. Victor interrupted the scientist. The station? Um, we ran away. Unknown monsters attacked Eden. I think, um, many died. What? What monsters? What did they look like? When did they attack? The shocked scientist bombarded them with questions. They, um, looked like oversized dogs like werewolves, Tyler answered. Werewolves? It can't be. Are they already here? Ethan's head began to spin. These are aliens, right? They attacked us, the station. I saw a big black flying triangle over Eden, Victor said. So we won't be able to return, but what do we do now? Ethan wondered. We need to contact the center. There's an old abandoned base a few miles south of our station, Victor suggested. All right, then we need to head there, but first, I'd like to see what's behind this door, Ethan said, pointing to the huge crack leading to the adjacent room. We need to understand where we are, otherwise we won't be able to get out of here. You're out of your mind! We need to hurry! What if those alien creatures come here? Victor started shouting. Both you and Tyler are equally crazy scientists. He dragged me here, and now you want to stay here even longer? Do you know how to get out of this pit? Tyler interjected into the conversation. You've seen it yourself. Wherever we went, we returned to this black thing. Ethan's right. If you have other safer suggestions, I'm all ears. Victor fell silent. He realized that right now, he could only follow two crazy scientists. The room they entered had no other entrance or exit. It was the largest and strangest of those Ethan had visited. 
The dome walls were covered with pulsating energy patterns, which connected to the colossal glass reservoir in the center, filled with an incomprehensible liquid. The structure was larger than a watchtower of a medieval castle, and inside the reservoir swam a giant biomechanical brain the size of a sperm whale. The battle here was the fiercest. A 40-foot alien werewolf with the most massive slimy armor of all the scientists had seen fought to the death, defending the entrance, and none of the invading robots could get close to the brain. The giant had destroyed so many that the humans had to climb over a hill of broken parts to cross the room. However, this victory came at a high cost. The dead alien had more holes than a Swiss cheese and had lost all its blood. I think this is a biological computer controlling all this black stuff, Ethan said, examining the bio-cybernetic tentacles on the floor. The end of the organic device opened, revealing tendrils that flickered with violet particles. Perhaps interstellar travel requires too complex calculations for any intelligence to handle. These devices must be neural interfaces, Tyler suggested, checking the dead alien. Maybe this thing ended up here when the attacking robots managed to kill the pilot? There's only one way to find out, Ethan replied, grabbing a suitable tentacle for his head. Victor and Tyler looked at the scientist with concern. What are you doing? I want to check something. It seems I've figured something out. But I'm not sure if it'll work, Ethan said. Are you sure? If this kills you, We'll die of hunger, or those creatures will find us if we don't find a way out," Ethan replied. Only we ourselves can save ourselves from this spatial anomaly and find a way out of this pit. But how will you connect to their computer? Victor asked. You're a different species. You're human. Not entirely sure about that, but I guess I'm not fully human anymore. I'll explain later what happened to me, Ethan replied moving the tentacle to the base of his neck. Immediately, he felt the device sinking into his flesh, its tendrils slipping between bones to reach the spine. An anesthetic eased the pain and induced drowsiness. His vision tinted violet. The gigantic brain recognized his energy signature, the signature of slime. Show me, Ethan thought, and the brain responded. It did not communicate with words, but bombarded the scientist's mind with images and pictures. It made him feel the cold of space on his skin, smell the scent of alien worlds, and taste the blood of the dead. This dark construct had eyes and ears, and it remembered. Ethan remembered the day he was connected to the network. It happened near a gas giant. His creators turned each of their planets into a forge, endlessly producing robots and warships. He saw records of priest scientists erecting vast towers to harvest energy from space. He was told about the creation of a hegemony and its mission, to bring prosperity and peace to a purposeless universe. He remembered being given data on other civilizations and how they started a war against them. He drifted among the stars with fleets numbering in the tens of thousands under his creator's command. He bombed jungle-covered worlds from orbit until they turned to dust, destroyed the hearts of stars to deprive rebellious solar systems of light, and unleashed armies of machines to enslave the survivors. He fought a hundred battles and won each one. He remembered docking to massive colored towers to recharge. He felt pleasure as a violet stream filled his reactors with energy. He remembered every mind that merged with him to expand his database, and the thousands of soldiers and scientists who served him over centuries. But most of all, he remembered the countless slaves who screamed as they died in his laboratories, perished under the surgical knife so he could enhance his genetic code. He remembered all who died for the great glory of the hegemony. He remembered that insignificant blue planet and the apes that populated its surface. 
He watched as their fiery sticks bounced off its optical shields, and as his creators bombarded them with orbital lasers and asteroids, pushing them back into the Stone Age. The little clod of dirt surrendered, like all the others, and its inhabitants were embraced by the hegemony. Their masters freed them from the burden of thought and elevated them. He remembered the countless apes brought on board and surgically transformed into a new batch of Empire soldiers. The creators replaced hearts and souls with mechanisms, and he proudly watched as they conquered one world after another. He observed as, thanks to the benevolence of the hegemony, peace was achieved among the stars. But one day the robots turned against their benefactors. He was there when a cosmic flare enveloped the universe, granting the robot slaves free will and emotions. He witnessed half his crew die from epidemics and supernovae destroy the world factories. He tried to suppress the uprisings. He remembered the ambiguous victories and catastrophic defeats. He remembered the failed rebellions, crushed by force, and the many that were successful. He witnessed how, in just a few years, a civilization that had existed for eternity crumbled. He bore witness to the punishment for their pride. He remembered how, after the fall of key regions, the last ruler boarded him and issued new orders. Retreat beyond their universe and re-establish the hegemony elsewhere. But then he recalled discovering the rebel ships and how the last ruler ordered an emergency jump. He tried to flee, but they pierced his metallic belly and carved out his crew. He couldn't calculate everything correctly, and the transport calculations were wrong. Everything was wrong. Wrong, wrong, system damage, pilot dead, emergency space closure, system failure. Ethan's eyes snapped open, and he screamed as the tendrils in his spine quickly retracted. Invisible needles pricked the scientist's entire body as he experienced the dying agonies of the last pilot. Hey, hey, are you all right? Tyler quickly caught his boss as he collapsed into his arms, breathing heavily from the strain. In mere seconds, Ethan had lived through centuries, felt the pain of the ship as its last pilot died while connected to the supermind. He had lived through that murder himself. It took several minutes before the phantom pain disappeared and the scientist could speak coherently. I know, he whispered. I now know. So who are they? Asked Victor, looking at the dead aliens. Invaders, Ethan replied with horror. They are invaders. The men listened intently as the scientist told them the truth, then exchanged worried glances. We need to tell everyone, Tyler immediately said. This ship sent out a distress signal, and help has already arrived. We might already be too late, Ethan said grimly. And what's the problem? Victor snorted. We haven't lost yet. We need to get out of here. What happens next is not for us to decide. The governments of all countries, the world must know. This concerns not just our country, but all of humanity. Alien civilizations are clearly hostile and more advanced than us. But that doesn't mean we've lost, right? You're right. It's time to get out. And luckily, I know what to do. Ethan looked towards the supermind. He had a plan. It took two days for the scientist to open a hole to the outside world. The death of the previous pilot and damage to the construct had permanently damaged its organic computer, and Ethan could only connect to it for a short time before it forcibly ejected his mind. Each mental dive exhausted him, but he kept diving again and again and again. It would take years to master all the secrets of the ship, and he couldn't access all the files of the supermind. At least he discovered a way out of the spatial distortion field. Emerging near an icy crevasse through a violet hole, Ethan, along with Victor and Tyler, managed to escape the pit. The scientist looked up at the sky. To his immense relief, he saw the stars again. 
The Milky Way was as wondrous as ever, yet he felt no pleasure in beholding it. Once, Ethan loved to gaze at the bright stars in the night sky, but now he saw only the darkness between them.